True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 22, The Murder of Francis Rasuche. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to give a shout out to our three new Patreons, Lynn, James Paris, and Rolia Skuman. You three are absolute superstars, and I really appreciate your support, as well as the ongoing support of all of our existing Patreon supporters. Support received on Patreon goes toward expanding our research capabilities by paying for access to databases and the like, and also for the purchase of equipment. If you prefer a once-off payment method, we also have a PayPal account, which can be accessed at paypal.me forward slash truecrimesa. I'll leave both links in the show notes. I decided to cover today's case because it's not only another sad example of domestic violence in our country, but it's also a very interesting case from a legal perspective, as it involved what is referred to as a nobody murder conviction. This case also has several offshoots to it, which make it not only complex, but one of those stories that sticks in your mind for many years to come. So let's get into episode 22, The Murder of Francis Rasuche. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Francis Nyadi Rasuche was described as a jovial person by her father, William Rasuche. Even as an adult, she continued to live with her parents and siblings in their home in Hamanskral. Francis lived with her twin sister, Wilhelmina, brother Opa, sister Nene, and mother. As her adult life progressed and she occasionally became involved in relationships, she would spend time at the home of a boyfriend, but always maintained her parental home as her main place of residence. In reading the testimony that her family members would later give about her and the events that would unfold, it is very clear that the Rasuche family was extremely close. The whereabouts of its members were always known to the others, and while as adults the Rasuche children may have understandably not shared everything about their private lives with their parents, they certainly made their parents aware of the major events in their lives. After her studies, Frances enrolled with the SAPS and was a police constable at the time of her disappearance. Of her work ethic, Frances's superiors described her as extremely loyal and dedicated and very serious about the importance of her job. It would be this dedication that would ring alarm bells for her family and co-workers on the day of her disappearance. Frances was never married, although she did have several long-term relationships. Attempts would be made to paint her as someone who was involved in many relationships at one time, but my research doesn't indicate this. Only one of Frances's partners would ever say that she had been seeing multiple men at one time, and he would be the same man who was accused of being involved in her disappearance. William Gadifele Nkuna claims to have met Francis for the first time in May 1998. Nkuna was married and had children with his wife. He lived in Temba, which is an area adjacent to Hamanskral, and was well known in the area. We'll get into some of Nkuna's more nefarious dealings a little later in the episode, 
but many would later say that Nkuna was feared in Temba, far more than he was loved. Nkuna owned his own home, but his liaisons with Francis would always be elsewhere. It is claimed that his wife was aware of his courtship of Francis, and that he had intended to make her his second wife. This is something that needs to be understood about this case, because for most the idea of a married man seeing a young woman is taboo and considered adultery. There are still many South Africans, though, that practice polygamy or multiple marriage as part of their culture. South African law only recognizes multiple marriages for men and only under the Customary Marriage Act. So if a man wishes to take a second legal wife, he must apply to the court for the right to do so, and each case is addressed on its own merits. Existing wives are required to give their consent for additional marriages, and of course the prospective new wife must be doing so in full knowledge of the situation she'll be marrying into. Each polygamous marriage is formed with its own legal agreement as to the distribution of assets in the case of divorce or death. So, in short, there's a very good chance that Nkuna's legal wife was well aware of his relationship with Francis. It is, however, unknown whether Francis had intended to marry Nkuna at any stage. Their relationship was on and off, and none of her family members ever indicated that they were aware of the possibility of marriage for the couple in the future. The couple's relationship has been described as tumultuous by most who knew them, and it would later emerge that, sadly, there were a few who had been aware that physical violence had occurred within the relationship as well. The timeline of events for this case seems to begin on New Year's Eve, 2003. Francis and Nkuna had been celebrating the New Year together, it seems, and an incident had occurred in which Francis was attacked by Nkuna. When Francis returned home on the 1st of January 2004, her mother Caroline became aware that Francis had been involved in a violent altercation with Nkuna. Caroline would later testify that she had phoned Nkuna that day. She told him that he needed to stay away from Francis because their relationship was no longer healthy. William Nkuna had responded by telling Caroline that he would rather kill Francis and then commit suicide before he ended their relationship. Shocked and grasping at anything to calm the man, Caroline told Nkuna that before he did anything stupid, he should think about his own children and who would care for them if he wasn't around. Nkuna allegedly responded that that wasn't an issue because his wife would care for them. He later denied that this conversation ever took place, but Caroline was not the only one who spoke of Nkuna threatening Francis's life. As is common in abusive relationships, despite Francis's pleas for Nkuna to leave her alone, he refused and continued to call her and attempt to visit her. The period between January and March 2004 had Francis desperately trying to continue with her life, and an equally desperate Nkuna, attempting to infiltrate her life. In March 2004, Francis met Abner Ramasodi, and they would start a relationship. He would describe their relationship as a happy one, but they were independent, and although Francis visited him about three weekends per month, she still stayed with her parents during the week. Abner was aware of Nkuna and his past relationship with Francis, but he was under the impression that they had no more contact. Although that may have been true from Francis's end, Nkuna was insistent that she give him another chance to redeem himself. 
Abner's neighbour would later testify that she had been introduced to Francis as Abner's girlfriend in May 2004. Francis seemed a little more closeted about this relationship with her family. Her siblings were aware of it, but her parents were not. The events that occurred in May 2004 would be one of the turning points in Francis and Nkuna's dealings with each other. There is very little information about how this came to be, but on the 10th of May 2004, Constable Francis Rasucha walked into the police station near her home and laid a charge of rape against William Nkuna. She also filed for a protection order to prevent him from contacting her by telephone or visiting her. Although a police officer would later testify under oath that he had delivered a copy of this protection order to Nkuna and that he had signed for it, Nkuna would deny that he had any knowledge of the protection order. He would also deny ever having raped Francis and said that she had been convinced by unnamed people to lay charges against him as retribution. It is, of course, not uncommon for victims of domestic violence to eventually build up the courage to lay charges against an abuser, only to be convinced by them to withdraw the charges soon after. This, unfortunately, was the case with Francis, as on the 26th of May 2004, just 16 days after she'd laid the charge and requested the protection order, she withdrew them. I think the fact that Francis was a member of the SAPS really underlines the level of fear that domestic abuse victims endure. She, of all people, should have felt protected and safe. She had a support system in her family. But still, she felt it necessary to withdraw the charge. Perhaps the opposite is true and maybe because of Frances's role as a member of the SAPS, she knew better than anyone that a protection order is simply a piece of paper and does very little to actually stop the perpetrator. In addition, she would likely have dealt with rape cases herself in the past, and the sad truth is that rape victims are often re-traumatised by the process of bringing their rapists to justice. It is unknown as to what level of contact was maintained between Francis and Nkuna after this. Her family said that he didn't visit their house anymore. But there certainly does seem to have been some interactions between the pair. As in July 2004, when the Rasucha family experienced a death in their extended family, Francis arranged to use Nkuna's car to make funeral arrangements. In early August 2004, Frances asked her siblings to accompany her when Kuna dropped her off in Pretoria for a course that she had to attend. Frances's siblings would all testify in court that the reason they had gone with that day was because Frances was afraid of Nkuna and didn't want to be alone with him, but needed the transport. Nkuna, on the other hand, would say that this was rubbish and that they had all just come along for the ride because they had nothing else to do. Francis's relationship with Abner was still going strong and on the 25th of August she went to a Russell's furniture store to arrange a surprise delivery for him. She ordered two appliances and gave Abner's address for delivery. His neighbour would later confirm that she had received the appliances on their behalf, and that the last time she had seen Francis was later that day when she arrived to surprise Abner with the gifts. Abner and Francis planned to attend a funeral together that weekend for one of Abner's relatives in another town. The plan was that Francis would have her hair done the next day and then come straight to Abner's house so that they could make final preparations for their trip. 
Frances's siblings were also aware that these were her plans for the weekend. Frances's sister would later testify that she had seen William and Kuna outside their house on the 26th of August. She had been annoyed at his presence because of his violence towards her sister. She was also surprised to see him there because he hadn't been at the house since May of that year. On Friday the 27th of August 2004, Frances got ready to go to the hair salon. She realised that her phone was not charged, so she plugged it in and asked her brother if she could use his cell phone for a few hours. She would then pop back home to swap out the phones again after her hair appointment and then head off to Abner's house. This would never happen. And the next time Francis's brother would see his cell phone, it would be bagged as evidence. Desmond Mkonto owned Le Des Hair Salon in Temba, and Francis had been a long-time customer of his. He described her as a kind and polite woman, but noted that she didn't engage with the gossip and personal sharing that went on in the salon, like most of his other customers did. He would later testify that Francis had indeed come to his salon on the 27th of August, and that he had straightened and styled her hair. She told him that she was going to a funeral with her boyfriend. When it came time to pay, Frances said that she'd have to call someone to bring her the balance of the money that she owed him. Desmond was familiar with William and Kuna, and recognised him as the man who had come to his salon that day, and contributed money towards Frances's hair appointment. Nkuna had asked Frances where she was headed, and she said she just needed to get to the taxi rank at a nearby shop right. Nkuna offered to give her a lift, and she agreed. This was the last time that Desmond ever saw his long-time customer. Abner became concerned when Francis didn't arrive at his house on Friday as arranged, and by Saturday morning when they were supposed to leave for the funeral and she still had not arrived, he eventually reached members of her family by phone, who confirmed that they too had no idea where she was. She hadn't returned to swap out phones with her brother, and the phone she had with her was switched off. Abner was left with no choice but to continue on to the funeral on his own, as his family were relying on him. Frances Rasuche was 27 years old at this time, an adult, and it wasn't uncommon for her to spend nights away from home, so the fact that her family couldn't contact her on Saturday, the 28th of August, was not strange and didn't raise any alarms. On the afternoon of Sunday the 29th of August, when Frances's co-workers arrived to pick her up for a shift and found that she was not home, both they and the Rasuche family knew something was very wrong. Frances had never missed a shift without advising her superior beforehand. While her co-workers stood in the house, Frances's father phoned William Mancuna. He said that he had no idea where Frances was, and that the last time he had seen her was on Friday, when he collected her from the salon and dropped her off at the taxi rank at ShopRite. He had no idea where she'd gone after that. A missing persons case was immediately opened, and police interviewed Desmond Mukonto, the salon owner. He told them that Francis had indeed left with Nkuna. Police traced activity on Francis's brother's phone, which she'd been using, to Hammond's Kral Town Centre. The person who was in possession of the phone claimed that it had been sold to him on the previous day. When shown a photograph of William Nkuna, he identified him as the man who had sold him the phone. On the 30th of August, 
William Kuna was advised that he was a suspect in the disappearance of Francis Rasuche. Despite Nkuna constantly declaring his undying love for Francis, he never once contacted her family to find out if there was any new information about her whereabouts, nor did he offer any assistance to the police in the investigation. When questioned about the cell phone that he had sold in town, Nkuna claimed that Francis had given him the phone to use because his own phone wasn't working. He claimed that the phone had been stolen from him by the person who claimed he had purchased it. The police soon proved this to be untrue by seizing Nkuna's own cell phone and proving that at the time that he had Francis's phone in his possession, he had made 89 calls from his own number. It also makes no sense that Francis would go away for the weekend and leave herself without any means of contact. Francis's bank records were checked, and it was ascertained that money had been withdrawn from her account at ATMs in the area after the 27th of August. Several withdrawals were made, totaling 1,200 rand. Police checked the CCTV footage at these ATMs for the times of the transactions. It was not Francis making the withdrawals. It was difficult to identify the person's face, but it was a black male whose build was consistent with William and Kuna. The man was wearing quite a distinctive shirt, with large black and white stripes and a white collar. When questioned, Nkuna admitted that he knew Francis's PIN number, but denied that it was him that had drawn money from her account after her disappearance. On the 3rd of September, the case took another strange turn when William Nkuna opened the case of conspiracy to commit murder. In his statement, he claimed that he had been advised that Francis along with one of her SAPS co-workers, was planning a hit on him and had hired a hitman to kill him. Although he would later remove Francis's name from the charge, it seems that perhaps William Nkuna was already building a defence. On the 6th of September, a search warrant was carried out on Nkuna's car. In the boot on the boot mat, police found traces of blood. Although an attempt had been made to clean the blood, police were still able to retrieve a sample and tested it. It was confirmed as belonging to Francis Rasuche. With no sign of Francis and her victimology showing that she was not in the habit of disappearing, William Nkuna was charged with causing her disappearance and arrested. Nkuna's explanation for the blood on his boot mat was that he and Francis had occasionally taken the mat out to have sex on, and on one occasion she had been menstruating and had bled onto the mat. He had noticed it and tried to clean it off, simply because he thought it looked dirty, and not to hide it. I wondered whether there was a way that the lab could tell if the source of blood was menstrual flow or not. And I'm very grateful to have very smart listeners who help me out with information like this on occasion. I'm not sure if said awesome lady would like me to mention her name in connection with this, but you know who you are, and thank you very much for the following info. In response to my question about whether a lab would be able to determine whether blood was menstrual or not, I received the following response. The major source of DNA will always mask the minor source of DNA in an analysis. The major source will be your white blood cells, which occur both in menstrual blood and blood from an artery or vein. In the case of menstrual blood, there would also be vaginal epithelial cells present, which in that case would present as the minor source. Because the major source is still the white blood cells, though, 
that will mask any presence of epithelial cells. So a human blood swab would not be able to differentiate the two. If the blood had not been cleaned, blood spatter analysis may have been able to tell the difference, although it could not be determined whether the blood source was indeed from an injury or whether it was really from menstrual bleeding. The presence of the blood, its location, combined with several other pieces of circumstantial evidence, including the fact that Francis had laid a rape charge against Nkuna, taken out a protection order against him, and he was the last person to see her before she went missing, made a pretty compelling case against him. I think that Nkuna's arrest at this time was the police's attempt to get him to admit what he had done with Francis's body, because no body murder cases are notoriously difficult to prosecute, because you don't only have to prove that the person you've charged has committed the crime, you first have to prove that the person is actually dead, without having a body to prove it. With children, this is a little bit easier, because if they aren't in the care of the person or people who would be assigned to their care, there's very little chance that they wandered off and started a new life of their own accord. With adults, however, this gets a little bit more difficult. Adults are under no legal obligation to report their whereabouts to anyone. They can come and go as they please, and although it's rare, it is possible for an adult to completely drop off the map and start a new life somewhere else. And therein, lays the no-body prosecution dilemma. Physical evidence is helpful. If you find a pool of blood that is DNA linked to a missing person, and you can have an expert testify that no human being could survive that amount of blood loss, the leap from missing to dead is not that far. Unfortunately, a killer who is able to dispose of a body so well that it cannot be recovered is also probably not going to leave that amount of physical evidence behind. The blood found in this case was not sufficient to have caused loss of life. The fact that it was found in the boot of a car is a lot more suspect as that would be a natural place to expect a body to have been transported. But Nkuna had an answer for that, which couldn't really be disputed in isolation by the evidence. If in a no-body case, physical evidence is found in a place where it should not be by the natural course of an ordinary action, that makes it a lot easier to point to murder. Say, for instance, Francis's blood had been found on a hammer or on the inside of Nkuna's wallet it would be far more difficult for him to claim that the blood had been from a source other than an injury. He could try it, but it's unlikely that it would fly in court. Victimology is one of the most important parts of securing a no-body murder conviction. If the victim in question is reliable, loyal, lives a low-risk lifestyle, and has no history of disappearing on their own, like Francis, then it's much easier to show, if they go missing, that that pattern of behaviour is out of character. Unfortunately, this is the reason that people who live a high-risk lifestyle, like sex workers, drug addicts or transients, would be extremely difficult victims to prove without their body being found. The States had a pretty decent case against William and Kuna, but it didn't have everything it needed. The state needed something to prove that Nkuna had been well aware that Francis Rasucha was never coming back. Soon after Nkuna's first arrest, it is claimed that he admitted to having killed Francis, but told the police that they would never find her, because he and his traditional healer, Phineas Kutumela, had dismembered her body and used part of it for Muti purposes, and disposed of the rest in a location that only Phineas was familiar with. For our non-South African listeners, 
Just a short side note on the concept of traditional healers and muti practices. Traditional healers are commonly consulted in many African cultures. It is a practice that is as old as recorded African history, and probably older than that. Traditional healers, in their base sense, use plants, herbs, and sometimes animal body parts to help heal their clients, both physically and spiritually. The closest similar concept for Americans, for instance, would probably be a medicine man in the Native American culture. The word muti refers to the medicinal concoctions that traditional healers put together, and it's been adopted into South African slang, English and Afrikaans to just refer to any form of medicine. Muti, however, also has a darker meaning in Africa, as although any flesh used in the making of muti should be animal-based, there are some offshoots of the traditional healer community who believe that the most powerful medicine is made from human remains, especially the heart, genitals and tongue. The traditional healing community is regulated, at least in South Africa, and registered traditional healers denounce the practice of using human remains in Muti. But we do know that it still happens in the underground arena of traditional medicine. People are murdered for Muti purposes, and several cases relating to such murders have been brought to prosecution in South Africa. If you want more information on Muti murders, The podcast Profiler Africa has an excellent episode on the phenomenon. Nkuna would later deny ever having made this accusation. But shortly afterwards, 68-year-old traditional healer Phineas Kutumela was arrested on suspicion of having been involved in the disappearance of Francis Rasuche. Nkuna claimed that he and Phineas had a decades-long relationship and made allegations that they had carried out other crimes together in the past. Phineas denied being as close to Nkuna as the man claimed. He admitted that Nkuna was one of his clients, but said that he was no closer to him than any of his other clients. The arrest of the traditional healer would be another sidetrack in this investigation. Police say that, working off information from Nkuna, they interrogated Phineas within the bounds of the law, and he eventually led them to three different locations, where he claimed Francis's remains were disposed of. Extensive searches of these areas unearthed no evidence that human remains had ever been there. Police also said that Phineas had handed over a jar which he said contained the cremated remains of part of Francis Rasuke's body. Lab analysis, however, showed that the ashes were of a vulture. All these false admissions seemed to stem from one thing, though. Phineas Kutumela would eventually take the Minister of Police to court and successfully sue the state for 500,000 rand in damages. Why? Because he was tortured in order to provide the statements he did. Phineas was able to prove that police had beaten, electrocuted and tortured him until he gave them the information about Francis's whereabouts. The state prosecutor would later publicly announce that Phineas Kutumela was in no way linked to the disappearance of Francis Rasuke. Let me be clear here. Although the state was found guilty of having used less than standard interrogation techniques against Phineas, I don't think this happens all the time. Police in any country take a strike against one of their own extremely seriously, and with good reason. There is a camaraderie that forms between people who put their lives on the line on a daily basis that I don't think the average man on the street can understand. And I think that the police's actions against Phineas 
were a symptom of that. It was William and Kuna who told them that the man was involved in the first place. It wasn't something they'd come up with themselves. This, of course, does not excuse the behaviour, but I think it may help us to understand it and acknowledge that this is not something police are doing to every murder suspect that comes through the interrogation rooms. With no body and a less than watertight case, the state had no choice but to drop the charges against William and Kuna on the 3rd of March 2005. He was released. The police then started trying to find anything they could to get him back in jail, and within weeks of his release, he was charged with fraud for using Frances's ATM card after her disappearance and without her consent. They had found an eyewitness who had been using the ATM just before the withdrawal was made from Frances's account to testify that the man who used the ATM after him was William Nkuna. In June 2005, a search warrant was served on William Nkuna for his home. The police were looking for ATM receipts as well as the distinctive shirt that was seen in the CCTV footage from the ATM. The police officer who conducted the search would later testify that when he had been unable to locate the shirt in the cupboards, Nkuna had actually suggested that he look in the laundry basket, and that's where he found the shirt. It was an exact match to the one seen being worn by the person in the footage. That's along with the fact that Nkuna had admitted to knowing Frances's PIN number, and that he'd been in possession of her phone, and had been the last person to see her, gave the state enough evidence to convict him of fraud. Because the police couldn't state in the fraud trial that he was also a suspect in Frances's murder, he was released pending sentencing for the fraud conviction. The fraud conviction, in turn, gave the state sufficient evidence to add to its murder case. If William and Kuna had been in possession of Frances's bank card, and knew well enough that he could withdraw money from her account over a period of four days, with no fear of her returning to seek retribution. He clearly knew she wasn't coming back. You could look at it another way as well, and consider that, like his insane case of conspiracy to commit murder against Francis, he was building a defence. If his attorney could present evidence in court that there had been activity on Frances's card after her disappearance, they could create doubt that she was dead at all. Unfortunately, William should probably have taken CCTV into account and not worn the most distinctive shirt he owned while making the withdrawals. Also, if he was hoping to use it in his defence, he probably shouldn't have offered up his laundry basket to the officer either. On the 2nd of April 2005, William Kuna was served with an indictment for the murder of Francis Rasuke. His trial was set to start on the 1st of August 2005, but he failed to arrive at court and a warrant of arrest was issued. Ever the one to do things on his own terms, Nkuna handed himself over a week later. Francis's family all testified against Nkuna in a painful pull on their heart. On one hand, they didn't want to have to believe that their daughter and sister was really gone. But on the other hand, they had been left without much choice but to accept that they would never see Francis again, and they had to testify in order to ensure that the man who had taken her from them was brought to justice. William Kuna's murder trial lasted just 10 days, and on the 10th of October 2005, 
he was found guilty of the murder of Francis Rasuche and given a life sentence, at the time, with the possibility of parole. The Rasuche family received justice, but they had to live with the knowledge that, in a way, William Kuna had still won. They were unable to lay Francis to rest, and had no knowledge of the whereabouts of her remains. A few weeks after William Kuna was sentenced, a man called David Cornelius, who claimed to be a friend of Nkuna's, came forward saying that he knew where Francis was buried, and led police to a grave. The body in the grave was exhumed, but turned out to be a body of a much older woman, and she had been killed long before Francis. In 2007, working on a tip, the SAPS dug up the entire garage area of William Kuna's property, where his wife and children still lived. They also brought in cadaver dogs to search the property and found nothing. In 2012, William Kuna's wife decided to sell the property in Timber, possibly having had enough of the constant rumours and the memories that remained in the house. The new owners started renovations almost immediately, and construction crews broke through two slabs of concrete, which had been laid underground in the front yard, seemingly serving no purpose. Between the two slabs, the construction crew uncovered human skeletal remains. Near hand bones lay pieces of duct tape, indicating that the person had been bound when they were laid in their makeshift grave. The SAPS kept the recovery under wraps and managed to process DNA results within a week, which confirmed that they had eventually uncovered the remains of Constable Francis Rasuche. A press conference was held and the news was released to the media. Unfortunately, in their haste, the SAPS had omitted a very important step, perhaps the most important step. The Rasuja family found out that Francis's remains had been found when a journalist contacted them for comments after the press conference. The SAPS had never advised the family. It was allegedly a miscommunication. The department who handled the press release had believed that Haman's Kral police were already advising the family, but that had never happened. Constable Francis Rasuke was laid to rest in an official police funeral in that same year, and the ANC Women's League proposed a motion to have Nkuna's option to apply for parole removed from his sentence. I was unable to find any information about whether they were successful with this motion, but the discovery of the remains proves that William Kuna was not only a murderer, but he took great pleasure from knowing that, even after her death, he was still controlling Frances and her family by withholding her remains. Shortly after Frances's remains were discovered at Nkuna's property, the SAPS returned there and dug up the entire yard. This time, they were looking for other bodies. You heard that correctly. Francis's case was not the first time that William and Kuna had been linked to a disappearance. In 2001, a Limpopa-based businessman called Ruben Cabini had left his home telling his family that he was going to visit William Kuna. He was never seen again. His vehicle was found a few weeks after his disappearance, abandoned near a felt area called Bosplas. Bosplas was one of the areas that traditional healer Phineas Kutumela had led police to in their aimless search for Francis' body. It is also alleged that Ruben's cell phone was found in the possession of one of Frances's sisters, who said that Nkuna had given it to her as a present. 
Ruben had a distinctive gold tooth, and this, SAPS investigators said, was what they would be looking for, in particular to identify the presence of his remains in Nkuna's yard. Another person who disappeared and was linked to Nkuna was a young woman called Helen. Not much information is available about her, but she was allegedly in a romantic relationship with Nkuna, and just like Francis, was last seen with him. Then, of course, we must consider the body of the older lady that Nkuna's friend had led police to. He thought it was Francis's body, and he must have thought that for a reason. So how was Nkuna linked to that murder, and who was that victim? Police didn't recover any further remains on the property of William and Kuna, but they did start to receive an avalanche of information about other cases he could have been involved in. The community, who up until that point seemed under a spell of terror from Nkuna, had started to talk. It was alleged that Nkuna was a hired hitman for local taxi bosses. Another family came forward, asking for their son's death to be reinvestigated too. In 2005, shortly after Nkuna was sentenced, one of the state's star witnesses very suddenly passed away. Desmond Mkonto, who you will recall was the owner of the hair salon that Frances had visited on the day of her death, was an important witness in the trial as he placed Francis with Nkuna on that day. Just days after Nkuna was sentenced, Desmond, otherwise healthy, suddenly began to feel ill. He told his mother that he was experiencing severe stomach pains and had lost feeling in his hands and feet. He was hospitalised, but doctors were stumped as to his condition, and within days... He was dead. His death was classified as having been from natural causes, but his family have never believed that. They believe that Desmond was poisoned. Of course, there's no proof that his death was in any way linked to Nkuna, but the people of Temba put nothing past him. In 2015, seemingly enjoying the reinvigorated attention, William Nkuna made a statement to the press through his lawyer. He claimed that the remains that were buried as Francis Rasuke should be exhumed because they didn't belong to her. He made mention of a gold tooth that neighbours had claimed to have seen in the skull of those remains before they were covered by police. He went on to say that he had many stories to tell and he would be doing so by means of a book that he wanted to write. The purpose of his statement was to put out a request for a writer to partner with him in telling his life story. Whether anyone volunteered for the job is unknown, and to date no book has been published about William and Kuna's life. William and Kuna remains incarcerated and whether or not he'll be allowed parole remains to be seen. By my calculations, and I stand open to correction, if he serves his entire sentence, he should be available for release in 2030. I wasn't able to find any recent information about further cases against him. It seems clear to me, though, just from his own statements about the book he wanted to write, that Nkuna has more to tell and very likely, much more to answer for. The people of Temba are grateful that the Ancunas have sold their property there, likely hopeful that their doors will never again be darkened by William Ancuna. The Rasuche family has a far longer sentence than William. They will not be released from their sentence in 2030. They will live with what has happened to Francis, for the rest of their lives. Her twin sister lost a part of herself thanks to Nkuna. 
Her parents lost a child, and all of the possibilities that went with her. It's a small blessing that they were able to lay her to rest, as many other families linked to William and Kuna have yet to be granted that closure. Frances Rasuke was very young when she met Nkuna, and although she had a good job and a strong support system in her family, she still fell prey to his abuse. It is my opinion that a lot of the effort put into this case came down to Frances being a member of the police force, and I can't help but wonder if justice would have been as swift and decisive if she weren't. Regardless of her job, she deserved justice just as, as much as the other possible victims of William and Kuna, who lay nameless and undiscovered in unknown graves to this day. Thank you for listening to episode 22, The Murder of Francis Rasuke. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on the app that you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Please stay tuned for a promo introduction to the awesome true crime podcast, Soon as State Crime Podcast. I will be back next Friday with a Spotlight Minisode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Howdy, all you True Crime South Africa listeners. Cece here, and I'm the host of the Sooner State True Crime Podcast. We cover cases based in my wonderful home state of Oklahoma, and since the term Sooner actually refers to the state's very first true crime, since they cheated in the land run, Oklahoma began as a crime state. So check out Sooner State True Crime in most podcast apps, or check out our website, anchor.fm backslash crime state. New episodes are released twice a month, so come away with me to Sooner State True Crime. Mm-hmm.